Hello, everyone. We are going to get started with our event this evening. I'm here to welcome you all. My name is Kristen Fleischman Brewer. I am the Director of Public Engagement at the Pulitzer Arts Foundation in St. Louis. I have had the honor of working with Monument Lab and our St. Louis research team and collaborators the last two years. In the summer of 2018, we invited Monument Lab to organize a project as a counterpoint to the Pulitzer's exhibition, Striking Power, Iconoclasm in Ancient Egypt, which brought together objects that were intentionally destroyed for religious or political purposes across 4,000 years of history. So the show was historic. The exhibition underscored how visual culture facilitates narratives of power, asking viewers to look deeper at cultural memory and the creation and destruction of monuments, cultural sites, and memorials across time and place. To make these ideas relevant, we often do uh, projects that ground the historical and contemporary moments. And so we asked Monument Lab to collaborate with us on a project about regional power and visual culture. So they proposed a research residency that would gather publicly sourced inventories of St. Louis's symbols and sites of memory in order to explore the question, how would you map the monuments of St. Louis? And that is the question that we have been trying to answer and explore together with St. Louisans in the last two years. So last summer, what we did is that Monument Lab and a team of local researchers worked from a field office at the museum and invited the public to participate in answering this question by submitting their responses in the form of a hand-drawn map. So the team attended 46 events. They engaged people from 141 zip codes, and they ended up building an atlas of about 750 maps, marking both traditional and unofficial sites of memory, whether they be um, what you might think of as a traditional monument, memorial, or landmark. Um, they might have, they might be currently existing, potential, historic, or erased. And the goals were to explore the relationship between St. Louis's residents and the city's inherited symbols as a means to explore, represent, and update the iconography of the city. So, of course, the last two years, the project has transformed a lot. It started as a public residency and community organizing project and has slowly transitioned into so social science evaluation and data sharing. At the same time, as we all know, the local and global contexts have drastically changed. Monuments um, have become focal point in the movement for equity and anti-racism work. The project now sits within the context of two pandemics. Um, whose health crisis further demonstrate social injustice and institutional violence that plays out in our everyday lives from access to health care to equity and education and the murder of black people under the guise of public safety. So how does all of this work fit together then? How do the actions of many that have been taking down monuments, um, you know, systematically, but also in protest these last weeks and months demonstrate care and energize the work of dismantling our racist systems. So this week marks a pivot in our collaboration as we share our two years of research with you all and bring together leaders in the field to discuss its future. Tonight's keynote kicks off um, a week of programming. We're super excited about the group tonight and the rest of the week. I hope you will join us for other virtual discussions and workshops. We're releasing a podcast tomorrow. And today we also just released uh, the St. Louis map. Um, that you can download from our website, but you can also have it shipped to you in a print version later this summer. So sign up to get that sent to you. It's going to be really fantastic. Before we get started, last but not least, just special thanks to everyone. The team at Monument Lab, they are incredible. Their leadership, sensitivity, and approach to working is like none other than I've had the privilege of working with our local research team and St. Louis collaborators whose vision and work informed and shaped this entire project and continues to as we move to the future. Thank you to tonight's panelists. Uh, Monument Lab's Paul Farber will introduce them momentarily. And to open uh, this evening, I'm pleased to welcome friend and St. Louis cross genre writer and storyteller, Shiraz Gorman. Greetings, everyone. 
Um, I just want to say thank you to the Pulitzer Foundation um, and to Monument Lab for having me in this evening. I will be sharing two pieces with you and I will kick it off with the first poem titled, Who Moved My Memories? Who moved my memories? Put them in flame, closed them down, separated what held them together. Sold them away to someone willing to pay a premium. Buried them underneath my feet. Stuffed them somewhere I can't see, made them look like something I don't know. Who knows why folks want to erase things? I see whole neighborhoods blighted by some sort of entity. Had it ever thought to stop and think about how we might feel? Or does it know we even exist? Or maybe it knows and wants to act like we don't. Wrapped us up in some sort of derogatory subhuman ghetto myth. Maybe it's fine with our ghost. Lost around this place we once remember just trying to find home, not attempting to haunt anything. But we can't find what we recall, what feels like yesterday. Those places that made us smile and have our laughter, sorrows, happiness, histories, our histories trapped somewhere in them. Now where is this love I'm holding on to? Who moved it and why? Perhaps those government notes that instruct us on who to trust takes precedence over a culture, a history, a people, an ethic over love and its preservation. Now, should I be mad? Because change is the natural order of things and it was never promised to be palatable, easy to swallow like the first kiss I remember but can't feel no more, but it was real. Yes, it was real. Home is real. What is missing once was and still is real. Who knows why folks want to act like we are not? Who am I now without these places I remember? Without my memories but in my head and even that's foggy at times. But now there's nothing but now there's nothing to show for what I know because I know what I know but who else besides me knows that it was real, is real to the people who lived, loved, yes, loved, laughed, worked, rested, watched each other's children cross the street, borrowed a cup of sugar, knew family secrets that could tell you when you got old enough to bear the truth, cut your grass when they felt like it, knew to check on you when the summers had a pinch of hell in it. The people, these people, what happened to the people in this place? Who stopped caring about the people? but I have eyes that see. I see the dividing lines, they aren't imaginary. I see what stands and what goes, what's abandoned and what's adorned, what opens up and closes down, what gets watered and what we allow to rot. I feel the old history limping its way around. I hear its old thoughts sprouting out of new mouths, coded language decoded in the blink of an eye and ample silence. Where did it all come from? This old ghost with this wrecking ball of a way, let me ask you something, ghost. What are you getting out of all this? Why are you laying it all to waste? Do you know nothing new can replace what has been because what was was priceless? See, see, I got eyes that see ghosts. They see what once was beautiful being just that, beautiful. Yet I see people trying not to see. And it's all visible if we care to look. So take your blinders off because it's all being seen. See the city, histories torn down, stolen from where they used to stand, so like they, like we, never mattered. Like we somehow were never precious enough with our memories buried somewhere beneath in a city that appears not to see all histories as equal. Tell me if we can't find something something that looks like our memories, something that feels like home. How are we to move forward? When I was growing up, my neighborhood was filled with monuments. My childhood home, a two-story red brick beauty with the first floor 14 foot ceiling demanding that every Christmas we had a tree that could hold its own in the space. If the walls could talk, they would sit you down, pour you something stiff and dish on every card party and game of dominoes played in the dining room. 
next door, my godmother, Jessie Wise, a non-denominational pastor whose house was this vibrant white red trimmed home with vertical concrete stairs that led up to her front porch. When the sun hit it just right, it glowed and she perched at the top with Bible within reach and something cool to drink no matter the weather. Looked like a beaming oracle who had the power to call the archangels down at her command. Across the street, my elementary school, Bryant Hill, with this sloped grassy knoll, sported a grand entry with doors that opened wide and wrapped each of us children in the warmth of its rich mahogany wood halls. The echo of lift every voice and sing could be heard in the key of proud black child after we whispered the pledge of allegiance with our tiny hands covering our innocent malleable hearts. And just a few hops, skips and jumps away, which I did on Sundays to holy name our family church. A brilliant cathedral that had all the Catholic splendor the eyes could take in. If Grand Avenue were a lake, you could skip a rock from the front stairs of the church to the base of the White Tower. A rare gem, neglected. These are just a few stops on my monument walk, whose meaning are more than myth. North, North Star on the north side of St. Louis that directs me home if I ever get lost. Thank you all for having me this evening. Thank you so much, Shiraz, for your powerful reading and for the opportunity to cross paths during our residency. Hi, everybody out there. Good evening. I'm Paul Farber I'm from Monument Lab. I'm co-founder um, and artistic director. I'm reaching you tonight um, from Philadelphia um, and want to acknowledge uh, that uh, we are connecting from, um, as I sit here, from the ancestral lands of the Lenape people um, and uh, for all of you reaching out and connecting tonight, I um, want to just say thank you. Um, before I introduce the uh, other panelists, I want to also give a lot of gratitude to the team at the Pulitzer Arts Foundation who uh, invited us to participate um, in a residency over the last several years. Um, a product of that residency, you can see um, online a link in the chat, a free map um, inspired by a AAA or Rand McNally map, but um, really about the past, present, and future based on um, 750 hand-drawn maps from residents in St. Louis. I also want to really make sure to acknowledge the Monument Lab team who worked on this project um, and also the research associates in St. Louis, Derek Laney, Liz Dykeman, and MK Stallings. Um, for tonight's conversation, I'm um, thrilled uh, and, and excited to be joined by um, three profound and um, brilliant people in the movement toward monumental justice. Um, on tonight's panel, and you'll start to see their faces uh, come up on your screen, um, or you should, we are joined by Zai Bryant, who's a student activist and community organizer um, who's studying at the University of Virginia. Um, and Zai's work on racial justice and organizing um, is mostly rooted in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, and Zai was also a inaugural Monument Lab fellow um, last year. So, so great to see you again, um, Zai. Um, also, Jeff Ward, professor of African and African American studies at Washington University in St. Louis. Jeff has been a collaborator um, throughout our residency. Um, he also contributed an essay um, this week on our bulletin, um, on the Monument Lab bulletin, um, about the data um, collected from the map makers and, and connected to his work in mapping monumental anti-racism. Um, and finally, uh, we are joined by Lauren Woods, um, artist uh, behind projects such as American Monument, um, and uh, a Dallas drinking fountain project and who, um, whose various life paths have also uh, routed meaningfully through St. Louis um, and is now 
uh, based in Dallas. Um, so just wanna say thank you. If this was a room full of people, we'd be um, filling it with applause and gratitude for all of your work. Um, so we'll imagine it in our head for a moment and maybe signal it right here. Um, I, I wanna start uh, with a question for each of you. Um, you know, we are in the midst of a summer uh, of reckoning, of uprising, of reimagining monuments and making sure that the conversation about symbols is also connected to systems of justice and injustice um, and entrenched racism. And so this moment is in some ways as a part of each of your uh, bodies of work. You've been doing work in this arena for years and helping to create and push these conversations and confrontations. So just for each of you, and maybe we start um, with you, Zai, and then we'll go in, in the order that I introduced. What is your day-to-day, -day, week to week, uh, look like this summer? Um, and how are you taking in this moment knowing that it's been a long time coming? So um, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I, I feel like everything changes week to week. Um, this summer has been a roller coaster. Um, I've been spending a lot of time organizing both in Charlottesville and Richmond, Virginia. Um, so the, I guess this whole like summer of action for me started um, with the viral video of um, the killing of George Floyd. And then we started to also like mobilize in the streets, but coinciding with that, um, the governor of Virginia um, decided to take down the monuments that are on Monument Avenue. Um, and the Monument Avenue in Richmond, Virginia has been there for over a hundred years. Um, it has humongous statues on huge pedestals. Um, and it's kind of like, a big like avenue that goes through the middle of the city so people pay millions of dollars to live on monument avenue um, and it's really a staple um, within the landscape of richmond so that press conference um, was held at the beginning of june i think it was it feels like june was like a whole year ago um but we he declared that he was going to take down that monument and then richmond started doing a whole bunch of direct actions um and so did charlottesville and so we've had black trans life matters um actions we've had black women matter actions and so for us in charlottesville our statues remain even after the august 12th attacks and the august 11 attack and all that's been going on for the past three years the statues remain due to uh, rulings and injunctions and calling them war memorials um, has what has been able to keep them in place so for me kind trying to ground ourselves back in that fight of getting those monuments down has been important but also realizing that we're in a, a college town so the university of virginia um, has a whole landscape that's built around erasing and covering up um, the legacies and narratives of enslaved people who built the university. And so being able to reckon with that as a student and also as a community member who's grown up here has been a part of something that's been on our mind this summer as well. And so uh, just three days ago, um, I was at a rally and a white student from UVA told protesters that we would make good speed bumps. Um, and so even after the August 12th attacks and even after, um, you know, we've had tiki torches left in activist yards in the middle of the night that were burning just last week, um, we are still living in the middle of trauma. And so I think, um, yeah, a lot of our work is because we are fighting to stay alive. And also we are fighting to say the names and tell the narratives of the people who have been erased for so long. So that looks like direct actions, that looks like attending public meetings virtually, that looks like writing op-eds to make sure that people know that they can take direct actions in their own ways from home, um, but also still having the hard and honest conversations about when we're going to start cop watching and when we're going to start um, court watching and when we're going to start building up the infrastructure so that these conversations last through everyday life. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jeff, do you want to go next? Sure. Yeah, I'm going to start by thanking you, Paul, and um, 
uh, Kristen and Josh from the Pulitzer and my fellow panelists. This is, I think, a, you know, just a tremendous time. And I think organizations like the Monument Lab and, um, and its partners like the Pulitzer, your vast network, look nationally, globally, deserve a lot of credit for um, helping us get to this point as a, as a, as a nation. Um, this point of reckoning uh, is, is, you know, to answer your question, what's my day to day like? Um, it's, it's so interesting to me as a sociologist who's been studying the politics of race for um, going on two decades now and writing about it and teaching classes every year on racism to see this, uh, this sudden reckoning to structural racism uh, is both bizarre and encouraging. Um, just give you an example of the sort of bizarre nature of it. The Chronicle of Higher Education, which is a major publication in, um, for you know, colleges and university teaching, recently put out a blog or something asking, you know, saying professors are now trying to figure out how they can teach about racism. And I thought, well, well you know, I, I commented, I think it was a tweet or something, I commented, you know, what, maybe start with asking, why haven't you been teaching about racism already? And, uh, but this is, a, this is a bizarre moment, but it's also heartening insofar as there is a broad um, global commitment to dismantling white supremacy. And, and I, think, uh, I think there's, uh, you know, I don't mean to suggest that there's a comprehensive, obviously across the board, you know, Zai's comments illustrate the point that this remains profoundly contested, but there is, a, um, a really um, broad cross-section of the society that's willing to acknowledge the need to reckon with uh, these issues. And, and, and in that context, um, this commemorative reckoning that we're seeing unfold is, um, is encouraging. So I've been spending a lot of time recently in conversations with uh, community partners, you know, whether they're um, um, concerned citizens or civic leaders of various sorts and people in government about why things like monuments and historical markers matter. I'll talk more about one effort I'm involved in in the city of Clayton where I live to have a specific historical marker um, amended or removed and I'll talk about that later but uh, um, uh, I just want to quickly mention why I think this is so important uh, that we're that we're that we're doing this commemorative reckoning, and you mentioned the need to connect the conversation around symbols to systems. Uh, Paul, as you know, we talked about this over a year ago. I, I've been doing work now for um, at least a decade on how histories of racial violence continue to impact us. Histories of enslavement, histories of lynching, continue to shape patterns of conflict, violence, and inequality in our society. And one of the most encouraging um, insights from this body of social science research is that in communities where people come together to actively disavow white supremacy, the legacy of, of uh, historical racial violence is diminished. And you know, this, this evidence is limited today. We don't have specific studies looking at whether monuments actually transform systems and how they do, but the evidence is at least encouraging uh, that we that if we engage in this kind of work, you know, of, of grappling with our inherited monuments and also engaging in other kinds of visual redress, you know, addressing the erasures, the silences, the other kinds of violence, um, we might in fact um, make significant progress in dismantling white supremacy. Thank you, thank you, Jeff, um, and Lauren. Yes, hi. Um, well, thank you again for um, inviting me um, onto this. I'm so excited. Uh, yes, I'm based in Dallas, but um, my family is from St. Louis and I spent a lot of time there. I actually went to SLU, um, uh, St. Louis University as well. Um, so day to day, well, so, you know, coming, sort of my life right now is live between three different cities. I, um, or pre-pandemic, I should say. Um, I'm virtually living between cities now. <laughs> um, but I was ba I'm based in Dallas. I actually teach at um, Brandeis University in Boston. I'm a researcher in residence at uh, University of California in Irvine. So coming off of the sort of, um, you know, uh, moment of March, April and landing in um, sort of 
quarantine, pandem post-pandemic life um, meant that I was grounded here in Dallas. And we had just came off of of um, what we thought was going to be the closing of the project that I work on in California, which is a project called American Monument, um, which is a, um, what we call a nomadic moving monument that like sort of lands into a city and takes over an existing architecture and sort of transforms that architecture into a monument to uh, consider the intersection of law and culture as it produces police brutality. Um, so we had just come up with this like really amazing um, convening, two day convening of legal scholars, law school deans, um, social ecology, linguists, artists, grassroots activists, um, political leaders, um, literally 12 hour days of processing through all of these intersecting fields. Um, and I came back to Dallas and thought I was going to have like a summer of rest <laughs> from that. And, um, and then, of course, as um, Zai said, um, the 2020 uprising sort of popped off, right? So my day-to-day -day has been uh, supporting comms for a local coalition here in Dallas um, in defense of Black Lives um, Dallas that is under the umbrella of Movement for Black Lives. Um, and it has organizations, basically, I'm a I'm a sort of free agent, or we, we kind of throw around what I am, but um, not and not being part of one organization, um, I sort of work to support multiple organizations for our local defund the police effort, and so I'm supporting comms, um, and so we have Mothers Against Police Brutality, Black uh, Youth Project 100, um, Palestinian Action Committee. Um, Dallas Alliance Against Racism, Political Repres uh, Repression, or Texas Dreamers, DSA, you can imagine it's a very like wide coalition of, um, of um, organizations doing some pretty amazing work here. So uh, what I thought could be a moment of rest, which I really did actually need, um, uh, as I pre was preparing to actually move the base to Boston, has literally been um, every day, day to day, um, working hyper locally on our movement here and we're basically gearing up for uh, the August budget talks that happen with the city. So we got we pushed the city enough to get them to write a memo to acknowledge uh, we need to start looking at defunding and what that means, which was a win if anybody knows our political landscape in Dallas. But um, there's no rest because literally, uh, you know, after working with council, we now have to work um, to get to the beginning of a long drawn out bureaucratic process uh, all summer. So I'm actually a little bit pained that I haven't been able to like fully participate in the conversations, the national conversations that are happening around monuments. And I mean, I'm participating in the sense that I can zoom into a panel here and there, but writing about it, um, documenting it, um, those sorts of things, given that my entire sort of professional uh, artistic practice is at looking at uh, and tracing racial histories through the built environment. And so I actually made my first proposal or I sketched out my first proposal for Confederate monuments back in 2006. So I've been thinking about this for a very long time, but I haven't actually been able to participate in it. Um, because for me, like I've been, you know, sort of had to prioritize a the, the defund movement, right? So that's what I've been doing. Great. Well, thank so I'm you. actually excited to be able to like take a pause and like talk about all this right now today. Yeah, we'll, we'll dive into it. I mean, I think this is just kind of trying to connect a number of the things that are brought up. We, you know, part of what we're seeing is um, a profound um reinvention and reimagining of monuments as sites of struggle and this is not news for a lot of people on this panel or this call um, but this idea that monuments are timeless that they're universal that they should just exist above us has been pushed against and dismantled in of itself um zai you brought up the idea and the site of monument avenue in richmond and seeing the lee circle be renamed and reclaimed as marcus david peter's circle um, as a site of, um, of protest, of reinvention. Um, and this is happening around the country as well. And, and um, the takedown of the Christopher Columbus statue in uh, St. Louis is another example. And so we have momentum and pushes against the status quo. We also are in a moment where um, the White House released an executive order um, authorizing force against people who um, 
aim to, to interact or engage with monuments and it's resulted in, um, you know, um, un, unnamed um, or unbadged federal authorities in Portland, Oregon and um, the, the kind of paramilitary tactics being put against people and we have this collision course. I'm just curious for, for any of you, how, how do you balance on one hand the, the kind of glory in seeing monuments toppled to colonizers and racist figures and also understand in your long arc work how you push against other forms of authoritarianism and anti-Black racism? So I'll start. Um, so I think it's interesting I wrote uh, in like a blog post a couple of weeks ago um, when the very first monument came down, I think it was Stonewall on uh, Monument Ave in Richmond, I wrote that the same people who are, you know, out there every night trying to reclaim space, trying to push to get these statues taken down, go home at night and talk about evictions. Um, and so I think in a place like Richmond and even in Charlottesville, in a lot of these public spaces where these Confederate monuments stand, um, a lot of our houseless neighbors sleep there overnight. Um, and so it's, we cannot ignore um, the, the housing segregation or you know, the affordable housing crisis that is existing um, alongside this issue of monuments. And so I think um, right now, tonight for City Council in Charlottesville, there's a piece on the agenda about uh, cutting the police's funding for them to have militarized weapons. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's just an example of how people who are showing up to get the statues taken down in Charlottesville are also organizing public comments for that. Um, and so our defund Seville um, police campaign has been led and crafted by activists and the same activists who were there on August 12th and the same activists who have been trying to keep the community safe. Um, but also it's important to note that there are armed vigilantes and white supremacists who stand outside of the Lee statue and uh, the Johnny Reb statue in Charlottesville every single night. And they have these humongous assault rifles and the police actually give them like preferential treatment, go in and check on them and make sure everything's okay for them. And so I think it's important to think about the fact that the police are cooperating with these white supremacists who are carrying out these uh, these attacks in Portland and Charlottesville and in other cities. And so I think that's why it's so important that we draw the parallels um, between and the connections between these issues. Um, so I, I, I think I agree with everything Zaya said. I think, um, one of the things I think a lot about, you know, I, I study social movements, I've written a lot about social movements over the years. And um, I mean, first of all, the movement for black lives to man to, deserves just tremendous credit for, um, and, a, and an and a sort of a global apology for all of the shade that was thrown, uh, you know, uh, just recently, you know, several years ago, people said, oh, this isn't a real movement. This movement doesn't have longevity, doesn't have leadership. And um, the, the empirical evidence to the contrary is just overwhelming right now. So that's one thing I think that that's, um, and it's related to your question insofar as, um, you know, this is a broad based movement, a broad uh, humanitarian and, um, and uh, free, freedom movement, civil rights movement that is not reducible to um, any particular issue, although there are some issues that are obviously at the forefront, like uh, over policing and under protection and those sorts of things. But uh, but it's broad. But it's it's broader ethos around um, the violence of white supremacy um, is is translatable to so many of these um, issues of structural and cultural and direct violence that we have to grapple with. So I think I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that it's providing us with an injustice frame and, and, and resources that can be mobilized and resources including networks, um, uh, uh, communication strategies, leadership, organic leadership, you know, all these resources that can be mobilized over the long term um, to maximize the impact of this 
movement. One other thing I wanted to say though about the um, the toppling of monuments and and, uh, and so on is, I guess the question that I'm I really uh, keep coming back to is how do we make sure that this moment is indeed transformative, in you know really changing uh, the structure of our society and given I mean the tremendous odds against that like the um, uh, the system of private ownership and sort of capitalist markets that dictate so much of the precarity that people struggle with around access to things like, you know, um, the livable, way, you know, basic housing, healthcare, um, quality education, and so forth. Uh, so there are tremendous odds. And how do we how do we maintain ensure that uh, the, the transformative impacts of these efforts? I think the what we're seeing, you know, as I was talking about in terms of the um, aftermath of these topplings of, of monuments is indicative of how in some ways I think these what we're seeing is is reinforcing the uh, so in some ways what's happening is uh, I think runs the risk of re, re, reinforcing these um, these kind of wounded attachments so people are you know doubling down on their uh, white white racial identity in the sense in in, in, in the sort of you know, when they feel it is under attack, when you you know sort of uh, challenge the, um, the, the the legitimacy of a of a monument to the Confederacy, and I think we have to find ways to move people to a new understanding of their interests, and uh, um, I appreciate to be clear, I appreciate the uh, collective action to remove objects in places where the state has proven its unwillingness to do so. And I think it's, it's, it provides a kind of foil that is very helpful in terms of pressuring other jurisdictions to act. In, in my own community here in St. Louis, in, um, in, in the city of Clayton, I've been trying to work with uh, city officials to address the, uh, uh, the, the, the problem of white supremacy in our, in our commemorative landscape. Because I, not because I, believe that that's the best way to get things done. I know it's the way to do things really slowly and maybe not much at all, but because the reason I've been doing that, and this is related to Lauren's point about bureaucratic processes, because I, I'm hopeful that in that, in the, in, the, in the sort of dialogues that then occur and the, um, and the public pronouncements of people like our mayor or city council members, we have a, a greater chance of achieving some um, lasting uh, transformative uh, uh, change in our society, in part by addressing things like the deep distrust in uh, state institutions, legitimate distrust. Um, we have the potential through those processes, I'm hopeful, and I believe, and I realize this is also somewhat naive or at least um, let's say, um, hopeful, uh, we have the potential to, uh, 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 to address some of the estrangement and, and resulting cynicism that exists in our society among people who for so long have been abandoned, neglected, um, unheard in, uh, in, in halls of government. So, uh, but I, you know, I think this is, to me, an important part of balancing this collective action with the, um, the need to address broader problems of, uh, of, of inequality and injustice. Paul, can you kind of restate um, the question? I didn't get to write it down and I have to process it. Yeah, that. well, it, it was a kind of balancing between the profound um, impact of, of people-powered toppling, um, or reimagining of public spaces around the addressing of systemic racism with the rise in the, the pushback, um, especially um, state violence at local, state, and federal levels by those who are um, doing that very work in public space, and kind of how you balance the, those forces or find another way to see it. Mm -hmm. um, well, I don't know if I balance it, <laughs> <I don't, laughs> but... Um, I think what this moment really points to is actually the importance of public spaces and public spaces that contain public memory. 
I think that in terms of um, this moment of toppling or, or, or examining Confederate monuments and then toppling them, et cetera, et cetera, like as it, as it became linked with, because really it was the movement for Black Lives that became, that was the foundation for this current push, you know, seven years ago when it started. Um, so for me, what that signals is A, these spaces create the, the grounds for public discourse and public spectacle, right? Um, to sort of have the container um, of, of a growing sort of organization, a growing movement towards social justice. And we need those public moments of spectacle. We need those moments in public to happen. We need um, public space for that to happen in. Um, and then we need public, we need engaged, um, active, um, Civic, civics discourse, right? Civic discourse um, to start to um, speak back to these things that are written into our landscape, right? So for me, that's what is interesting about this moment. Um, I do find a fundamental difference between people power toppling and um, the sort of municipal processes that happen that end up in removal. Um, and for me, there's I want to create sort of a difference in, in, in that I believe that in terms of, I, I love to see spontaneous toppling, right? But when we come to the municipal bureaucratic processes, I believe that we are missing something to have a more radical, even more radical um, political imagination around what's possible, right? And, and I don't tend to see that happening, right? So to speak to Jeff's point a little bit, I think we can keep pushing in our municipal sort of engagement um, to have a more comprehensive plan of what happens after these things are removed, sanctioned wise removed, what happens with them, what happens with that public space. Um, and not just sort of the quickness to react and like settle it, right? Like, because really the, the statues coming down represent a history, but the pedestals really are what represent white supremacy right and that's what we are actually fighting against and so i think those pedestals are the interesting parts of this whole thing um, that we can start to imagine or start to think about how we can sort of co-opt those pedestals to keep holding the place of what we're pushing for which is justice right so that's where i am and you know anytime you read a headline in the newspaper or online now about a monument coming down or being toppled you know, it, it doesn't include the years of organizing, of critical art making that went behind it. And I always try to tell people, like, just just trust that anytime you see that story, there is work behind it that's not being acknowledged. Um, I want to ask you first, Lauren, and then Zai, can you take us back to 2006, I think, when you said that you started working on um, the co Confederate um, monuments in Dallas and kind of if you were able, as you were steering your work and your thinking, kind of what, where were you headed and, and what were the kind of important ideas that you saw that needed to be responded to then? Well, just to say, so I didn't start working in Dallas on this specific issue on 2006. I just actually just sketched out a proposal. So in 2006, I was um, just graduating from grad school. I went to San, uh, San Francisco Art Institute. Um, and I had um, already started a process with the County of Dallas to launch my first public monument, um, which was a drinking fountain project. But when I sketched out a drinking fountain project, and to just give you a little bit, a bit of background, a drinking fountain project came about out of, after this moment in 2003, where in a county records building, in the county records building of Dallas, which is a place where you go for birth records, death records, taxes, driver's license, it, like it's all in the building, right? Um, well, in 2003, this incident happened, which is like one day and the, on um, the first floor at the main fount drinking fountain, there had always been like a metal plate that was like tacked on to um, the marble wall sitting above the fountain. And so one day in 2003, it just fell off. And what it revealed was that it had it had preserved the traces of white only, right? So there used to be white only painted onto that marble. Um, they scraped it off during desegregation, but the marble was affected forever. Etched into that was white only, and they couldn't buff it off. And they just left it there until the 80s when we, re when we got elected our first black uh, county commissioner. At that point, people started to like point out these things in the building again. They tried to buff it out, wouldn't go away. 
And so they just decided at that point to just cover them up with like these metal like sh sheets and everybody forgot about it. And so in 2003, when it fell off again, um, people were like, what, 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 whoa, whoa, you know? So it really created this like um, local, really intense uh, public discourse. It made it to some national channels because it was conflict of what to do around it. We couldn't buff it out. So they would literally have to cut the marble out, right? In the end, they ended up voting, the county commissioners voted four to one to keep them in place, uncover them all, and uh, put up a plaque that explained history. So they contextualize it, right? Um, I was in Dallas and getting ready to move to San Francisco when all of this was going down. So um, I just kept it in my head. And so when I went to grad school and I started, I'm a filmmaker by training, but I sort of have entered into this more public practice um, of monuments uh, through sort of learning uh, ideas about monuments. So when I learned about um, Maya Lin's Vietnam Memorial, when I learned about the Eisenman um, Memorial to Murdered Jews in Europe, uh, it really clicked for me what the possibilities around this moment in Dallas could be. So I actually sketched out my first uh, drinking fountain proposal in, in school, proposed it to the county commissioners. They said, sure, whatever, go ahead. If we don't have to pay for it, cool. And then um, as part two to that, I always had my eye on um, the Lee Monument in Dallas because I grew up around it or I grew up knowing it was there. And then initially back in 2006, when I sketched that out um, as a part two to my drinking fountain proposal, um, the idea, because no one at that time was paying attention to monuments, right? Um, so I was like, how do you get the public to start seeing what's in their built environment again? So I had the thought that we just need to reveil it and like let people see this black veil hanging over this huge, uh, I think it's like, I don't know, 15 ton statue. And then question what's missing, right? The thing that we ignored. Um, and then we'll re reveil it and have a public discourse around what should be happening with this. Um, fast forward, it took me about 10 years to get Drinking Fountain number one launched. Uh, I had to raise the money by myself, like all this kind of stuff. So I kind of ran out of steam for the part two. Now in Dallas, which was the Confederate monuments. So in Dallas though, starting in the 90s, people were, are on record for, for petitioning to have those statues removed here in the city. Um, so when was it? 2017, I feel like is when um, the the, the monument, the National Monument Zeitgeist re reached Dallas, right? right. So um, I was like, oh no, like I had all of these plans and like I didn't get to like help lead this. And so I was sort of brought in by uh, the group of activists that led this, the removal um, to, to work on it with them and like help write the resolution and things. But I always maintained that, um, and sort of my strategy was that, sure, the city, if the city is not ready to put some real effort and money behind a more radical, to me, what would be a more radical solution um, of addressing these monuments, which is like, can we basically make them desacralize them, right? Like make, make them non-sacred so we can take and really, excuse my language, fuck with these things, right? Like we can take these objects, we can break them up, we can melt them, we can bury them. Like what can we do to mark the moment that we're actually in right now? which is really significant, which is that people, right? These monuments have always existed as racial terroristic propaganda. And now we're actually like in a zeitgeist in a mass movement to address this. How do we mark this moment, right? Knowing that this is not the end of white supremacy, right? Like we can't greenwash any of this away with like putting some grass down on a bench, you know? So I was like, if we can't do that, sure, they should come down. But I really think we can do this, you know? Well, it proved to be a little bit um, too political at the time. I actually pushed a, um, a proposal to the council um, on this idea of re recontextualization, but it got co-opted by the other side um, to say it was like sort of a, a um, compromise, right? And so that's where we are, you know? So uh, I sort of had to like break away as my artist self to be like, no, I really think that artists have been working on these ideas we know the technology of these things. We understand its power. Um, and so I was really advocating for cultural workers to get involved in this and help lead it. But there are, you know, sticky politics around how artists participate in civic life. So I can speak more on that later, but. Yeah, I, I just have one follow-up for you before, before mm -hmm. switching to Zai. You, you talked about like the, 
the goal of culture workers and artists to do what they do, what, what are the barriers to that? Is that imagination? Is that money? Is that entrenched power systems? I think it's a few things, right? So I think the first problem is that culture workers have actually um, not stepped in to our role, right? Um, we tend to be introverts, we work along, we're individuals, like whatever. We actually don't, so I see my, so let me rewind. I see my practice in two sort of ways, right? I have this studio practice, I have this public practice. I see the work in my public practice as me bringing the skills of a trained cultural producer into civic life, right? So that means that I don't need to produce necessarily signs or art or design or decoration. Like I have a skill set where I can go in and look at anything through the lens of a cultural worker, right? So for me, it's like, and there's a legacy of that in the art world. You have artists that have been in residence with the sanitation department of cities, right? And they're not making art. They are intervening with a skill set in a particular system through the lens of an artist. So that's how I tend to work, right? I don't think a lot of artists like take that position, you know? We kind of take an agnostic position in terms of like engaging civically with our particular skill set. So I think that's the first thing that um, when we get into these public moments that are really at the center of this is about the symbolic realm, right? Um, and, and the technology built into the symbolic realm um, that artists aren't stepping into their role to sort of lead that. Like we can decode why, we know why these monuments are problematic, but, or we know that they're problematic, but do, does the public understand why they're problematic? Do they understand the technology of what it means to put something on a pedestal that hovers over you and how the body feels, right? Um, so that's first thing. The second thing I think is just in general, there's a distrust for artists because there's a lack of understanding about what we actually do and how we study and all of that kind of thing. We're seen as like crazy people who cut off our ears and like sling paint around, right? Um, <laughs> like literally all, my, all of my entire practice has been like trying to dispel that, right? Um, so there's that distress. There's also the idea that because we're as a human species all creative, that like slinging paint is not an actual like skilled thing, right? Or thinking deeply about the culture and symbolic realm isn't skilled because we all kind of engage in creative practices in our own sort of like domestic and, and hobby lives. But the idea that professionals do this differently, I think, um, is a thing that's stopping people from like considering us professionals to bring into this conversation, right? So I think it's a, it's a little bit of, from both sides, a misunderstanding of A, what our roles are, and then B, what we actually do, right? Or can contribute. Mm. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And, and Zai, I want to shift gears to you. You know, back in 2016, as a high school student, you started the petition uh, to take down the Robert E. Lee statue in Charlottesville and rename that park. And um, for you, what was your interaction or relationship to that space um, growing up? Like, um, and, and if you can, as like kind of second part, how did that moment inform your work as an organizer? Um, and yeah, just thinking about that as a moment now in, in retrospect. Yeah, so um, the petition to city council to take down uh, the lease statue started originally as a class paper. Um, we were assigned to think about and reimagine something that we wanted to change in the city. And so I wrote um, that letter to the editor, which then turned into a change.org petition. Um, and so, yes, I was a ninth grader at Charlottesville High School. Um, I had been like on some city panels and like youth type of activities, but nothing really like um, on this scale. And so I really did not fully realize that I was opening a can of worms until after the petition was already public. Um, and so for me, I think the story of how we started organizing around these monuments here in Charlottesville is kind of like a testament to my story as like an organizer, as a grassroots organizer, because as we started to go through the public processes of um, having the Blue Ribbon Commission appointed, which the city council appointed to have um, this commission, think of all the the ways that they, what they could do with the statue. So all the ways that they could address this issue. Are we going to um, recontextualize these statues? Are we going to move them? Are we gonna like 
put flowers around them? Like what, what are the options that we have? And so a part of that was a process of uh, public town halls. And I think during those town halls is when I really realized like, wow, historians are really cool. And they have like all the information that we need for these movements. Like I realized that uh, Paul Goodloe McIntyre was the person who donated these statues and commissioned um, the people, the sculptors to build them. And um, he is, you know, the same man who donated the downtown library as a whites only space. And he also donated a park um, adjacent to black neighborhoods in the 10th and Page neighborhood in Charlottesville, which is near downtown. And he dedicated Washington um, Park to be a Blacks only space. But what we found through this public forum process is that people had been doing digging on the, I guess, the, the significance of these spaces. And so they found that Washington Park was actually built on a landfill, built on top of a landfill. And so thinking about like, what are the implications of climate justice and um, spaces where black people have been pushed to within cities and what does that mean um as far as health and like so we we started to have these bigger conversations about um environmental racism about different forms of structural racism and then we couldn't talk about these statues and the people who were involved in um donating them without talking about uh alderman who was a president of the university and who was present during the unveiling of this statue um, and actually was a part of dedicating it. So we can't, we can't talk about all of these things um, without having the conversation about how the university has played a role in um, making Charlottesville its uh, white supremacist landscape just like it is on grounds. And so I think for me, um, yeah, just like continuing to organize around getting them down has been a process because then city council voted to put trash bags on top of the statues and that lasted for a few months. And then that was ruled as like unconstitutional or illegal. And so that was the trash bags were taken down. And so the statues remain. And so and to a lot of people who are not from Charlottesville, they're like, oh, they're still there even after all that's happened over the past three years. And we're like, yeah, they're still here. Um, just like on grounds at UVA, the serpentine walls that line like the lawn. If you see any image of UVA, you see the rotunda and then you see the lawn. And um, the serpentine walls that guard the guidance, the gardens outside of the lawn um, were originally built to keep out the sounds of enslaved laborers. And so literally it was last semester in one of the classes that I took um, that my professor said this and the whole room was like, wow, I never knew this. Like I've taken so many Instagram photos in, in the gardens. And so I think it's like, it's just so important that we are in the process of getting these monuments taken down, educating the public around the history behind them, because then you're able to uncover so many things that people never knew about. And so I think while I would love for the petition to have been voted on and the statues to have been taken down immediately, I appreciate the process in retrospect because I understand that now I'm able to identify um, certain monuments throughout the city, like the Whispering Wall, where many students sit outside of one of our libraries on grounds and they read and they take cute photos and that's actually a monument to Confederate soldiers. And so if we're not able to identify those things, we're passively like interacting with these things that are super harmful to Black people. People. Um, and so I think it's just so important to have these public processes kind of like it was alluded earlier um, that we are having these transformative processes so that people can learn um, and also so that we don't go back to building more monuments that just shouldn't be there in the first place. Hmm. Lauren? Can I, jump in? can I jump in just to kind of yeah. uh, to amplify what I was saying? So when I was thinking about dropping the veil, it was exactly because I was like, how do we enact a public process of discourse? So I think what's really empower what's really powerful right now, more so powerful than the spectacle is the discourse that's happening. And that to me, that process, like letting a process fully unfold and not being so quick to come to its conclusion, actually to me is where the power for radical transformation potentially lies, right? Um, so just to say, like, that's, that to me is what is really important about this moment. Um, uh, the, the ability for people to feel powerful to speak back and to actually see something physically change, but also like to hold the space 
for really powerful discourse to happen that like allows a process of transformation of a paradigm shift, consciousness, like all of those things. And so to me, as long as we can prolong that, we're actually in a great space. I mean, this is a question for, for anybody. I wanna make sure to, to follow up through here. Like each of you have worked um, with political leaders or political systems and each of you have pushed against or illuminated outside of it. And maybe this is a better question about balance or at least practice. How, how do you kind of manifest your work in figuring out the moments um, to find the official process and the other ones where organizing, agitating, um, ends up pushing that discourse or pushing what's, what's necessary? I know in, in Charlottesville, um, a lot of the times when we're taking to the streets or organizing demonstrations, it's things that we've already asked nicely for. Like we've already went and made public comments at public meetings and you know they've been pushed aside or they've been ignored. Um, most of the time, I think honestly, a lot of us are now like professional FOIAs, um, searchers or whatever. So we always are filing like requests to find out what is already being done on these issues before we start to organize around them so that we understand like, okay, this is what's happening and this, but this is what's not happening. Um, and so I think for us, like talking about the statues and talking about narratives that have been erased has led to council putting more money into, I guess, like public history and talking about Charlottesville history. So the, the city council helped to give money to a Charlottesville pilgrimage, which we took in the summer of 2018, down to the EJI, um, to the memorial where there are all of the markers for people who are lynched around the country. And so, um, like the city council was very like invested in that project and making sure that we were able to dig the soil of where a man named John Henry James was lynched in 1898. And we took that soil down to the EJI. And then we went through a public process of getting a marker put up in front of the court square um, in downtown Charlottesville. So there's, there's balance there and now like Charlottesville City Schools are working to um, tell more of the histories of local people and just like local Charlottesville stuff with regards to the statues and other things as well. Um, and city council is investing money into that as well. So I think it's, it's a process. I think there are like ways where we're like, we need funding for this. But then when it comes to like defunding the police, like there's no real easy way to come to the table um, with city councilors who work with the police. Um, so it's really just building, I think for me, it's been a process of building our cases and finding ways to like crowdsource ideas um, within the community spaces or within organizing spaces and then bringing them to city council to present them. And if those requests go ignored, then we find other ways to mobilize around the issues. Um, but there have been city councilors who have joined us in the streets. There have been city councilors who went on the Charlottesville pilgrimage. So there, there are, these are people who, you know, also live in our community. They're also friends with us. They're people that we interact with every day. Um, and then in, on the university side, I think students have led a lot of that work to make sure that Charlottesville issues and UVA issues are being um, connected and that both bodies are working towards equity. I've been in mostly incorporating these issues in my research and teaching for the past, you know, many, many years. And, um, and, and some of that involves increasingly the development of courses that are designed more like practicums rather than these kind of abstract sort of theoretical seminars. And so my monumental anti-racism class, for example, we're building a collaborative database. This is a first year seminar at Washington University where students in their first year from various disciplines, some undeclared, um, join in studying the politics of public memory and, um, and the specific focus of the course is on how memory work constitutes an increasingly important side of anti-racist uh, struggle. And we read about that, we read academic work, we read popular work about that, but we also spend um, a lot of time building a collaborative database on um, examples of monumental anti-racism from all around the world. For example, sites of remembrance focused on the history of enslavement and its legacy. Um, all of the Confederate um, memorial redress sort of work happening around the country. Uh, this fall, when we come back together, we're going to be working with all of these examples from around the world 
in the wake of George Floyd's killing, Breonna Taylor's killings, you know, that uh, where this commemorative reckoning has occurred. So I've done a lot of this. I mean, I like what Lauren was saying about her, her practice as an artist. I have a similar academic practice that I try to organize in a public facing way by doing more um, accessible work, you know, more uh, uh, collaboration with community based organizations, also more digital projects. So less of the kind of standard, I, I still do the, the equivalent of what she was calling studio practice. I still do the scholarly writing and publication in journals and that kind of thing but I try to translate this work as much as possible in ways that both um, engage uh, broader publics and also push my students, challenge my students to um, translate their ideas into sort of actionable uh, interventions. And so the, the other thing my students do in the monumental anti-racism course, if you go to that um, site, you'll see these examples of interventions. Every student has to develop a, 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 pro, a final project that is an intervention where they identify um, uh, a potential anti-racist uh, commemorative uh, 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 effort and make a case for it. And in several cases, they've gone further and begun to talk with city officials. And this is their work is focused all over the country. Um, but, you know, talk with officials, uh, other stakeholders and trying to see this work um, happen. The other thing I'll say about um, this balancing you mentioned is I, I just have to acknowledge again how how much I'm benefited from by this tremendous wave of civic initiative that is I think largely creditable credit should be credited to the artist community. I mean the artist community has been really pushing this this work and Monument Lab and others have helped to elevate its visibility. I mean I learned about people like Sonia Clark, for example, and her amazing fabric art around the Confederate flag of truce which uh, yeah, I learned about that through Monument Labs podcast and just was tremendously uh, inspiring and also helped me understand as a soci sociologist kind of how the country was really moving, the world was moving around these issues and how important um, creatives are, have been in, in, in pushing us to this, to this point. So I'm benefited from that in the sense of being able now to say, hey, I happen to be a professor of this and I study these issues, but, you know, dear mayor, uh, we should be doing work on this because uh, you see it's important from everything happening around us, but also let me mention what we know from the social science research about how it's likely to be um, impactful. I also wanted to just um, really appreciate second what Lauren was saying about the importance of public moments of spectacle in, um, uh, you know, that, that really contest belonging, ideas of belonging and standing in a society that has been defined as a white place. And, and that's why I think these public moments of spectacle are so important. I'm reminded, you know, Du Bois wrote this powerful essay called The Souls of White Folk in it's a chapter in his book, uh, Dark Water, where he says, quote, uh, but what on earth is whiteness that one should so desire it then he says he always asks him this, himself this question. He says, then always somehow, some way, silently but clearly, I, I am given to understand that whiteness is the ownership of the earth forever and ever, amen. And what, so what's happening in this commemorative reckoning, I think that's so important, is contesting this proprietary aspect of whiteness um, and, and demonstrating to people, I mean, Zai was talking about this, demonstrating to people who are in many cases unaware, who don't read the historical markers, never really stop to think about what the statue represents, who are not aware of how this proprietary aspect of whiteness is literally written into our landscape. And then when we can have those public forums that, just, that acknowledge this and commit to repair, I think that, that opens up, you know, so I love Zai's point about the broader conversations that open up, questions around environmental justice, around um, other kinds of precarity uh, that are, are also part of how white supremacy is written into our landscape. So, um, so I just wanted to really hold up that point about the importance of these spectacles as opening mo as moments for opening a conversation that, about acknowledging and dismantling white supremacy. Mm. You know, Jeff, I wanna ask you a quick follow-up and then try to route through as best I can some of the conversation and questions that have come in by email or chat. 
Um, we had a great opportunity and fortune to work with you and David Cunningham and your students last fall um, with the data collected in St. Louis, the 750 hand-drawn maps. Um, what, what did you see and what do you think your, uh, by way of your observations, but also your students about monuments in St. Louis um, through that data, both like what was collected, but also how you discussed it and how you grappled with these um, very conversations about power and about racism inscribed into landscape. Yeah, so uh, so David and I, you know, we've been working together for a long time on legacies of racial violence, and, and we were teaching two different classes. Uh, actually, I was I, I taught two classes where we engaged the maps, but I'll, I'll mention one of them in particular. David's class worked with them in a much more um, systematic way. I mean, they you remember the they built basically an exhibition of the maps where the students were tasked with organizing them and different ways and making sense of them. And they did this, for example, interesting groupings of maps by the age of the respondent. And, and that I thought revealed some interesting patterns and also groupings based on whether these are existing or aspirational maps. Um, uh, both of us as sociologists found this just a tremendous opportunity to engage with uh, um, community-based institutions, arts institutions, you know, creatives around similar kinds of questions that we're grappling with in those courses. I'll mention a couple of things that stood out to, in my, so my monumental anti-racism class worked with the, the maps. We used it as a data set to explore the racial politics of public memory. And, and the question I put to the students was, and this was a very small class, about six students, and I asked them, what can you glean from this database? And just so people listening are, have more context, we had access to a spreadsheet that uh, basically codified information that's in the maps. And, and we looked at the spreadsheet as well as some of the map examples and asked them basically, you know, without leading beyond, much beyond that, what did, uh, what did, what do you see in the maps related to the racial politics of public memory? And, uh, and one of the interesting things that, that students identify, and this goes back to my point about uh, the proprietary um, aspect of whiteness, is they noticed that they noticed that maps created by respondents who identified as white more often kind of assumed a proprietary stance. For example, they re represented St. Louis as their city. You know, they used terms like my city, uh, my neighborhood, my favorite places. Um, you know. Um, a really confident sense of belonging, they noticed. Whereas by contrast, black respondents were more likely to convey a sense of alienation and uh, social distance, you know, remembering what was lost or stressing what is missing in the landscape uh, in terms of uh, 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 memory, public memory, and in, in, in various other ways, communicating displacement. And I wanna say, you know, this is by no means you know, this is, these are anecdotal impressions. The students didn't analyze systematically the 750 maps. I don't think this would even be possible in terms of the politics of race because of all the noise in the data around like the race, race ethnic identity of the map maker and their ties to St. Louis and zip codes and stuff. But, um, but that reading seems entirely consistent with um, the centrality of racism to the to the spirit of St. Louis and to the built environment of St. Louis. So, um, so I found that really interesting. The other thing I found interesting, I won't say much about because I wrote about it in the essay you mentioned, is is the iconoclastic kind of treatments of the arch, which you know your report de demonstrated. You know, the arch is like in like, like every every other map has the arch in it or something like that. But several maps I found really interesting. Um, uh, to use Lauren's term, fucked with the arch. They moved it, like they, they made it straddle the Mississippi River rather than sit in downtown St. Louis. And I found those refigurings of the arch fascinating, and mostly because of how they focus our attention on the river. And really, and that for me, given the work I do, um, make the arch a kind of memorial, a more explicit memorial to, um, the histories and legacies of empire and enslavement, you know, the Mississippi River as America's Middle Passage. I just found those maps really fascinating. And I don't think that was the intention of most of the artists per se, but, but just those disruptions of the symbolism I found really interesting in the maps and fruitful as a, 
as a, a, a as a conversation tool in my classes and beyond. Thank you, Jeff. So I just want to um, note we have about ten minutes left. We want to send people, you know, kindly on their way after this. But I, I want to try to um, quickly go through a couple of questions and give um, each of the panelists a final word to amplify what they want to, or or at least put give us words to move forward. So a question from Aaron Keith, who's based in New York. I'm just read part of it. Um, do you feel like statues that need to be need to be pulled down and remade, or is it better socially to remake them in the space completely to emphasize the removal of these negative icons? Um, so this maybe goes back to some of the things we were talking about of like, are, it's not just the two options or leave them up or take them down, but just to curious to hear any, any of your takes on this question from Aaron Keith. Lauren? So yes, yeah, so my position is recontextualization. And just to give you a quick note of where I'm coming from with that, I didn't really explain the drinking fountain project, but what I ended up producing through this uh, uh, moment of discovery of the white only sign, um, which is I pushed an idea of recontextualization. I took the fountain, transformed the fountain into a video playing machine. So when you go, so I consider it an intervention, right? When you go to it, it just looks like a regular drinking fountain. You push the button and instead of water coming on a projection of a collection of images from the civil rights movement starts playing you have to sit there and watch it before you can get water so the water comes on after and that created a big conflict as well because everyone's like it's texas it's too hot we have to have water right it's like nobody drinks out of water fountains that often anymore but okay so we we got that done and for me, that was a recontextualization, right? So I call that monument a drinking fountain to the uh, organizer, to organizers, right? Um, it's acknowledging and it creates a conversation around why only, what it took to get these signs removed, and then what the actual political context is now. So in that space, for a moment, it's under reconstruction right now, but we would host um, um, sort of political education, like uh, in, a, in a county hallway, right, around different issues. And because we launched it in 2013, um, the movement for Black Lives was popping off and starting to happen, right? So um, we were able to have like different organizations come down to the monument and literally hold space in just a hallway to talk about contemporary issues. And so the idea was that I would keep adding in videos um, that was the legacy of the, the civil rights movement up till today. Um, so for me, with Confederate monuments, this is this. It's the same. It's the same space for me that this could potentially happen in. In my city, in particular, there's two monuments. One is Lee Park. That monument came down. Uh, another is uh, Confederate. The Confederate Memorial, which is different from the Lost Cause, Lost Cause uh, sculptures, um, because it was actually built right after the Civil War to honor the dead, like dead people that were, you know, tied to that to that to our city, the city. And that resided, was moved to a place called Pioneer Park that was created to commemorate the pioneers of Dallas, which meant that you had a graveyard of like Ku Klux Klan grand wizards, like whoever, you know? And then you had this like Confederate monument or memorial. And then you had this weird $9 million like atrocity called, uh, of, of um, it's called, it's the largest landscape sculpture in the world according to Wikipedia, which is like a cattle drive of um, longhorns jumping over a river, right? So we have that also in Pioneer Park, which is literally signaling settler colonialism and indigenous genocide. So I wanted to fuck with that space. And I saw that the way to intervene on that and to create, uh, to make an intervention where we could get people's history into this highly touristic space. I saw the way to do that was through this Confederate memorial. Um, and to me, take down the guys on the statue, right? Let's talk about white supremacy. Let's talk about the markers that we have to put in place on a city level with funding, with structures to actually start to attack the system and let that monument actually represent the unfolding process toward that larger goal of justice. So that's what I would like to see happen, um, to hold those spaces so we can hold, we can have some, some something that's symbolic that signals a process of holding people accountable and a process that is a, a protracted struggle toward justice, right? So that's, that's where I land on it. There's, there's one question that, that relates to that. I'll just read it and you don't necessarily have to respond just for the interest of time but, um, from Dana. Um, if removing monuments is seen as an instigator for larger conversations about erasure, urban renewal, 
how can we facilitate transitions um, to these larger systemic dialogues. Some of this is also fodder and important work that you're doing already. It, it's not an either or, but it's just important to, to put out there. Just with our final moments, I want to just turn to, to each of you um, and give you a chance for a final word. Um, and, and whether it's leaving us with um, some of the work that you're doing in your local sites and spaces, things that you're signal boosting or amplifying, um, or just intentions um, and words that you want for us. So um, Zai, I want to turn to you first. We'll, each person has, a, has about a minute before, before we end and we'll, we'll go around the group. Okay, so I think, um, I think this fight is ongoing and I think there's a lot of work that still um, has to go down, but I want to be clear that one, there can be no real reconciliation, um, no true healing without equity. And so I think a lot of communities are pushing around. So they're saying, you know, you want to take down statues? Okay, let's also give some symbolic measures. Let's have healing, you know, events. Let's have healing uh, concerts. But there can't be any of that. There can't be any tying of loose ends until there's actual equity, until funds and resources are being redistributed, until communities get what they need to actually be on an equal playing field. Um, and then I also think it's so important that we're centering the voices of the most marginalized people. And so I don't necessarily uh, believe in leaders anymore. I think that we need to be leading uh, horizontally instead of vertically. And I think that it's so important that we're centering the voices of Black trans people, um, non-binary Black and Brown people, Indigenous voices. And so until those people are the most centered, until we're hearing from them, we're still perpetuating different types of violence um, against marginalized identities. So I think it's important to find the people in your area who are doing the work on the ground, who have been doing the work on the ground, and, and put your resources and time and energy behind them. Um, and I saw a question about people who are allies to BLM. I think it's just so important to take inventory of your own identities and to question why you might say, oh, we don't need to take that statue down. Because if it offends any um, population that is marginalized, then it shouldn't be in public space, in my opinion. So just continue to um, unpack and listen and read and self-educate, but also show up in different ways. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Lauren. Okay, what was the question? <laughs> I got a one final, a final word. Final word. Well, I was going to bring it back to because uh, St. Louis is a second home for me. I um, was born in Kansas City. We moved to Texas with uh, when I was two, but I always spent summers and every holiday in St. Louis. And then I, as an 18 year old, made a choice to come back. Um, so it wasn't until recently that I accepted my Texas identity, right? But I think it's like an interesting place to be. Dallas considers itself the beginning of the Southwest. St. Louis begins, it considers itself the beginning of the West. And St. Louis has a very uh, longer history. It's an older city. Um, so I just wanted to like bring it back to that and think, and I, this question made me start thinking about, because I don't, uh, my professional sort of uh, life doesn't intersect in St. Louis in the way it does in other cities. And so I really began to think about like what monuments and memorials, like what do I remember? Um, what do I engage? Um, because for me, St. Louis is very much home. Um, and I don't look at it through that, those lenses. So I just made a quick list, which is, I never considered the arch to be a monument. And now I'm like, actually, okay, it is. It's not just architecture. That's a really interesting thing. But I um, talked to some of my family and, and no one considers it a monument. It's just like there, it's St. Louis, right? Um, so I think it's a really interesting thing to start to think about that. I, and we also should think about what the meaning of monument is, right? We tend to think it only means commemoration or memorialization, but part of the etymology of monument is also to warn. Um, and so we need to think about how do we build monuments that also warn of not commemorate something or memorialize something to warn about a future, but like warn about what we are in right now, right? warn toward a, a present future or something. So to think about it that way. So the arch, um, the Billiken uh, sculpture in the middle of St. Louis University that I went and rubbed its belly every, every day when I was on campus for good luck, random white guys and statues and parks, the fountains are what I remember. And to me, those are um, sort of monumental. Um, and then um, the, and I can't remember it, but uh, the mall where all of that public art of like random, people and sculptures are outside of. Um, um, that, those things to me are the places that stick out in St. Louis and then red brick, you know? 
um, in churches. So, um, so yeah, I, I'm just, it's really an interesting conversation to bring it to St. Louis and congratulations on taking, you know, the Columbus statue down, uh, was that this week or something. Um, so I'm interested to start following this right now, um, what's happening in the city. Mm. Thank you, Lauren. Mm -hmm. And Jeff. So two things I want to say. One is that this moment, I think, really speaks to the importance of the humanities and the arts. And, and, and one of the things I think we're in the midst of right now is undoing the destruction of the defunding of those endeavors, the, the neglect of those endeavors in you know, uh, uh, K through 12 and universities. I think this moment teaches us how important fields like Black Studies, Ethnic Studies, Indigenous Studies are to all of us, um, to our country. And I think that one of the things I'm encouraged by is the outreach I'm receiving from high school teachers who want to figure out ways to engage their students in these conversations and, and, and this work. Um, I think we've, you know, we, so that's one thing. I mean, this profound um, uh, ign ignorance born of um, neglecting these topics and then the misrepresentation of these histories uh, is something that we have to um, address and not, and not um, feel like we can resolve. You know, we're not going to sort of settle this and be done with it, but rather, you know, as social movement scholars say, you know, freedom is a constant meeting. It, you know, racial justice will be a process that we will hopefully be forever committed to not this outcome will reach uh, somehow magically in uh, some period of time. The other thing I just wanted to mention is related to that constant meeting is, although we haven't been able to meet as much given the pandemic, is that here in St. Louis, a number of us are working together and Lauren, you'll be invited. I can add you to our, inf our, our email list. I know you're in Dallas, but we have a group called the Reparative Justice Coalition of St. Louis, which is committed to um, grappling with histories and legacies of racial violence in our region um, and in and, and large part through commemorative uh, uh, through commemorative projects and so we would love to hear from people interested in in uh, working with us on these efforts and I just encourage people wherever they are if you want you know to want to get involved in these kind of work projects um, more likely than not there are other groups of civic actors who are similarly engaged and would and would welcome your uh, would welcome your participation. Well, on that note, immense gratitude. Oh, Lauren, you got a final word? Yes, I one more thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, just to say, um, I was recently for, um, in a conversation with a uh, coalition or a group of architects in LA that are thinking about public memory in LA. And LA has a different history of memory work and all that. I just want to put out there that wherever we are, we can think about our built environment and the memories that are actually like literally embedded in our built environment. So shortly after that discussion in that um, architecture's forum, um, out of that came an LA Times piece that was talking about um, highways, right? What would it mean to think about highways? And so this was a question I posed to the group is what we all have highways that have literally erased uh, marginalized communities, black communities. What would it mean to start to think about highways as a monument, right? Like, as we, like if we actually say publicly, we're going to make this a monument, treat it as one. What does that mean about these everyday objects that we engage in? How do we start to reorient and think differently? So that's, that's my also want to throw out there as a final word. Yeah, well, I wanna just say immense gratitude for Zy Bryant, Lauren Woods and Jeff Ward, um, please um, make some noise in your own house, shake the tables, um, hit the pots and pans, just um, thank you. And folks, um, also as a way to show gratitude, follow them on social media, read their work and cite their work um, as we continue. Um, immense gratitude to the team at the Pulitzer um, for their support in this, for all of you from, for being, being here with us tonight. Um, we invite you to join for other programs this week. Tomorrow, um, there's a discussion um, at 12 noon central time, racist monuments in our backyard, St. Louis justice efforts. Um, we'll be releasing the podcast interview with Mad Dad, that's Dee Nichols, uh, Mallory Rexana, Nazam, and Damon Davis. Um, you can get that podcast um, by um, searching the Apple Store or Spotify. Um, for the Monument Lab podcast. And then on Wednesday, there's a mapping and data session led by Lori Allen 
um, and uh, other members of the Monument Lab and Pulitzer teams. Folks, I just wanna thank you for being here um, and uh, good evening, keep in touch and um, keep on. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thanks everyone. Thank you.